sure the B580 launched to kind of a lot of fanfare. There are a couple of gotchas that we talked about, but mostly it's a really good card. Better value than anything else in the market when it launched in terms of frames per dollar, mostly. But now today is the B570 launch and we have the Intel Arc B570 Challenger from ASRock. And it's overclockable and it has some really interesting features. 10 gigabytes of VRAM, it's a little slower, but it also costs a little less. Let's take a look. Five eighty, five seventy. 570, a lot of the time, the better value is in the less expensive version of the product. But this has 10 gigabytes of VRAM and is clocked a bit slower, but ASRock is maybe making up for some of the difference in terms of overclockability, which we'll talk about. But this is a small two slot, truly a two slot card. It would actually work in a two slot configuration. It's still got a little bit of breathability. The fans actually sit a little bit lower than two slots. It's got a pretty good size cooler. It is a little taller than average, but this would be a good choice for a small form factor build. This also only uses eight PCI Express Gen 4 lanes. The layout here also has an LED on off switch at the back hidden through here, and it has flow through co cooling. So the, the PCB on this is actually quite tiny. And the card runs cool until you overclock it. And it runs pretty well overall. It's got a nice sort of understated RGB aesthetic, which you can control from the Intel Arc control software. And an update from the B580 launch is that Intel has updated their GPU software, like the whole software stack plan. And they've actually fixed some of the bugs that we identified on launch day. So that's exciting. In terms of IO, you have three DisplayPort 2.1. Only one of those can do the ultra high bit rate 13.5 gigabit. And I must point out, this is not the full DisplayPort 2.1 specification. This is an in-between specification. Shout out to everybody out there that's trying to support DisplayPort 2.1 in their products, like KVMs or whatever. Because everybody's like, when are you gonna get DisplayPort 2.1 KVMs? It's like, when we've got the full spec. This is only a half measure. Do you want me to come out with a KVM that can only do UHBR 13.5? And then later when somebody's like, I can't do the 20 gigabit standard. The other ports use ultra high bit bandwidth UHBR 10 which technically the astute among you will say, wait a minute, it's not just DisplayPort 1.4. The difference is DisplayStream compression and some other minor protocol updates. So technically it is DisplayPort 2.1, but yeah, only one of these can do the 13.5 bitrate signaling, which is standard. Like that's, that's actually really good. Like the other ARC B series, Battle Mage series GPUs do that. And then you get one HDMI 2.1A. This was a little bit more rough of an experience under Linux than the B580. Uh, probably just down to debugging and maybe something stupid that I'm doing I, because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of churn with Mesa and a lot of the other dependencies. So you'll have to wait for the, uh, the Linux review for a couple of days, but yeah, uh, let's take a look at the performance. Now, if we start with artificial benchmarks, things like 3d mark, our overall score. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty shocking. This is on our higher end system, a 9,800 X 3d system with 32 gigs of DDR5, 8,000. And uh, yeah, the B580 here is, is leading the pack for the GPUs that I tested with 33,370, but it is almost exactly tied with the Radeon RX 7600 eight gigs. I feel I need to segue for just a moment here because the artificial benchmarks are often a little misleading because you look at the artificial benchmarks and think, oh, this will translate into real world game performance. That is seldom the case anymore. Firestrike and Time Spy are increasingly divorced from reality, I think. It gives us a little bit of a ballpark in terms of like how things will perform, but it's not really like a great indicator. And our day one review, there are already people that have added comments in this video talking about how, well, you tested with a 9800X3D, you need to test with a, a weaker CPU. Our day one review said two very important things. There is a somewhat minor fly in the ointment. Modern games on an older CPU with a cutting edge GPU where they're really pulling out all the stops on the software side, the B580, um, can be not a fabulous experience. I didn't recommend the B580 for any system worse that has a worse CPU than an i7-10700. And that could be, you know, depending on if you've got a higher end or a lower end newer CPU, you could have a lower end newer CPU than a 10700 that is worse than a 10700. A lot of games, do actually use a lot of threads these days, but even for games that don't use a lot of threads, the GPU driver can also use a lot of threads. And Intel has very cleverly and brilliantly, I think, 
leveraged CPU hardware to make up for some deficiencies in their GPU, which I think is a better long-term strategy as desktop CPUs get more and more and more powerful. It's not as good for, for older upgraders. The other thing that I pointed out in the review is a bit of an anomaly between 1080p and 1440p performance. Now the thing that I want you to notice here is, wait a minute, 1080p, 1440p, this card doesn't scale resolutions the way that other cards do. If I've got a 4090 and I'm running at 500 FPS in Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p, oh, it's gonna perform really well in 4K. This card performs about the same, I mean, real world gameplay experience, not FPS numbers at 1440p as it does at 1080p. So Intel, when they say, oh, this is a good card for 1440p, what they mean is that the numbers don't look as good at 1080p, but the 1440p numbers are amazing. And that's probably owing to the GPU architecture and the, the engineering choices that were made here. If you just test 1080p, historically, you could sort of guesstimate where 1440p performance would be. But on these cards, and this holds true for the B570 as well, 1440p does significantly better than 1080p in terms of like the maximum number of pixels that it can push. Usually the GPU performance, it can push a certain number of pixels in a certain number, certain configuration. And when you increase the resolution, the number of pixels it's pushing doesn't really change all that much, but you get a lower frame rate because there's more pixels per frame, if that makes sense. And I pointed out, hey, this, this GPU, the B580 is sort of one of the first GPUs that's not really like that. Even at the $250 price point, 1080p performance was kind of meh, but the 1440p performance and ray tracing taken together, that's what really made a good value. And I pointed that out in my day one review. Those things still hold true with the B570. If you have an older CPU, you may not get the full performance out of the platform. But I also tested this on mini swarm uh, motherboards as well as that 10700 system, and I found the performance reasonable in those configurations. As we get into more games that would better utilize more threads or more CPU limited scenarios where the game itself is using more CPUs, you do get into a situation where the game competes with the driver for the GPU. And that is never a good thing because that can make the game experience significantly worse. Fortunately, this is something that Intel's aware of and they can tune, and this is a little different than other GPUs. In fact, the RX 7600 that I use for this testing can pull ahead of the 570 and the 580 significantly when you are in those specific CPU constraint scenarios. But that is a bit of an edge case. And if you aren't trying to upgrade an older system, generally, I don't think you're gonna run into that unless you are playing one of the CPU constrained games that fights with the driver. But I think that that'll sort of be tuned and figured out as time goes on. It's still pretty good value at like $200-ish. But we'll talk about value and stuff in a second. Now, in terms of game performance, 1080p games. Yeah, okay, the, the, the B580 is leading here versus the 7600 and the 3060 Elite 12 gig, but this isn't a bad result. And an old title like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it would be unlikely at highest you'd be CPU limited, especially on an older platform. And we can see here that the B580 is pulling just ahead of the Gigabyte Aorus RTX 3060 Elite. Now for DirectX 11 and Vulkan in Baldur's Gate 3, it's pretty much the same across the board, the same performance. I mean, okay, 64 to 71, 80 to 84, a little bit, that's a little bit more true with DirectX 11, a little bit less true with Vulkan, but hey, not bad. FSR quality on Warhammer, yeah, this is a perfectly playable 60 FPS for all four of these cards. And this is an important thing to point out too, because between FSR quality and no upscaling, I think this makes the difference between playable and less playable, like, 49 FPS even with FreeSync is not an amazing experience in Warhammer. Cyberpunk, we all love to test Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is still setting player records. Like it, it had a rough start, but it's a, it's a pretty fun game. FSR quality with frame gen on, 169 versus 167 FPS. Basically you're saving 30% off the cost of a, of a 7600, almost, not quite. Well, at least launch pricing, that was a year ago pricing. But there's new GPUs coming, so that's gotta be exciting, right? XESS quality with frame gen off, 108 FPS, and no upscaling with frame gen off, 84 FPS. Now with ray tracing ultra at 1080p, 93 FPS with FSR quality and frame gen on. Uh, at 1080p frame gen, like the quality is, like you gotta play it. Uh, the quality is not amazing, but it's pretty good. XESS quality is a little bit better um, for high visual fidelity, but I was surprised that 
the performance difference was as much as it is here, 42 to 72 FPS. And I'm not sure that this is a driver bug or some problem with the graphics selector for the B570. There were a couple little hitches like this that I encountered where it seemed like the B570 was performing better than 42 FPS and it was repeatable, but then I would come back and retest it later after playing for a while and it would be stuck here. I was like, well, maybe that's thermals or maybe that's something. No, but the thermals are really, really shockingly good. The thermals on this card, uh, you know, in the stock configuration, it's like 68 degrees C max. Uh, with an overclock, you can push it, but, you know, yeah. So the other thing is that... Uh, ASRock has actually left you a fair bit of over, uh, overclocking headroom. Now, I, this is the out-of-the-box performance, and so this is basically performing in line with, with Intel. And if you look at the, the boost clocks and the published specifications for this, 10 gigs of VRAM versus 12 gigs, you're never going to make that up for an overclock. But for this particular B570 with an overclock, I could claw back the performance mostly of a B580. So I could get very, very similar performance to a B580 from a B570, as long as I wasn't VRAM constrained, and as long as I was willing to spend 30 minutes to an hour fiddling with the overclock and power settings. This is a surprisingly more overclockable GPU than my B580 was for making significant, meaningful uh, performance uplift. But occasionally, games like Cyberpunk, a little weird. And these graphs, I tried to display, I tried to put all this together with no overclocking, pure out of the box performance so that you would know what to expect. And this XESS result, is a little strange. The no upscaling result gave me sort of confidence that hey, this is probably just a, a B570 thing because 22 versus 40 FPS with the no upscaling and frame gen off is sort of more in line with what I would expect for for this. And then 93 between 93 and 119 FPS, that's a pretty big difference. Now for 1440, this GPU offers a reasonable 1440p experience mostly. I worry about the future with the 10 gigs of VRAM, like 12 gigs of VRAM for future AAA titles. I mean, that, that may be pushing it. But for 10 gigs of VRAM, I wasn't really bumping up against VRAM limits mostly. But again, everything else on this card, the difference between 94 and 109 FPS, uh, I'm surprised that there was that much of a difference. I sort of expected everything to look a little bit more like Baldur's Gate. And we can see here that there's really no penalty for playing Baldur's Gate at 1440p versus 1080p, unless you just physically have a 1080p monitor, in which case it might be time to upgrade. Now, Cyberpunk at 1440p, this is the playable sweet spot. This is awesome. The performance here, again, calling back to the 1080p performance, look at the 1440p performance. Why would you just not play in 1440p? FSR quality, frame gen on 1440p. Those quality concerns that I was talking about at 1080p basically go away. You're off to a better experience here. Frame gen, this is a perfectly reasonable experience. And once you've played this, you're, you're not going to want to, like, you're not going to want to play with FSR quality and frame gen off and and XESS quality with frame gen off was, was better than XESS visually, but it has more CPU overhead. So again, remember, if you play this with a worse game, XESS is going to cost you a lot more than FSR does. FSR is very low CPU overhead, so that is very good for people that are playing on older CPUs in general. And that is true, more, more true on the Intel card than even some of AMD's own cards. But, you know, it is what it is. The F1 2024 results line up basically where you do expect based on the other reviews. Going into this, I was expecting the B570 to basically perform identically to the B580 or close to it, uh, just except in situations where you were VRAM limited. But with F1 2024, we're not really VRAM limited, especially when we're, we're talking about 1440p and, and the, everything that's going on here um, with the 1440p setup in the game. I am surprised that it is 20 FPS slower with XESS quality and frame gen on, even on our 9800X 3D. Um, but again, you can claw this back with overclocking. So with overclocking the GPU, I could get up around 134 FPS and still have a reasonable experience. But again, out of the box performance, it's clear that Intel is going super conservative with the clocks because you don't see it in the temperature of the card. You don't see it in anything else. It's maybe good for a small form factor build. If, if about hundred FPS is reasonable for you and, and a lot of titles, then you can have a cool and quiet, small form factor build 10 gigs of AM, VRAM gets it done. Et cetera, et cetera. I mean, may, maybe the choice would make sense. Blender 4.0, you know, percentage-wise, yeah, it falls off here. It's like I'm, I'm seeing a trend. It's like, oh, it's 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 a card that's like 13% cheaper, but also 13% slower. Interesting. And finally, our Geekbench 6 results, just for good measure. 
between Open uh, between OpenCL and Vulkan. The Puget Creator Suite is also not bad, especially when we're doing a comparison to the uh, RX 7600 8GB. So overall, what's the verdict? Well, it's cheaper, but it's also slower. But you can overclock it. But no amount of overclocking is going to make up for 2 gigs less VRAM. It's an interesting card. I feel like what Intel has done here is basically uh, every piece of ARC Battle Mage Silicon that for whatever reason would not work in a B580, they've put in a B570. And so they've set the floor <laughs> absurdly low for the B570. But that's good because that gives you a lot of overclocking headroom. Okay, fine, that makes sense. ASRock has given you an overkill cooler, even though it's a two-slot cooler, two-slot, two-fan cooler, so that you can do significant overclocking. So, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see the comments once people get these and they do the overclock, what the overclocking lottery looks like. But for me personally, I hit the overclocking lottery jackpot with the B570. So, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, this is the OC edition. ASRock's probably doing their own binning. There's probably a non-OC edition, right? <laughs> but OC it does. If it were me, I'd probably spend the extra money to get the B580, though, even with all of that. Even if I knew that I had a 90% chance. I'm not saying it's a 90% chance. It might be a 50% chance. It might be a 10% chance. But even if there was a 90% chance that you could overclock it and claw back and get most of the performance of a B580 out of a B570 but still have 2 gigs less VRAM, the cost differential between these two, if you can get a B580 at MSRP, I'd probably just go for the, B, the MSRP B580 because... It's a fair bit more guaranteed performance, and the B580 also has a little bit of overclocking headroom, depending on which model you get and the cooling and everything else. Because again, the out of the box reference, like the reference cooler on this thing keeps it cooler than 75C in basically every scenario. And if the reference cooler can do that, then you can imagine what the partners have done. So interesting, it's an interesting launch. The B580 has been hard to get, so I think that's probably good that Intel is selling more than they expected to, or they're trying to get supplies and everything else. But we've also got new G GPUs launching from both NVIDIA and AMD, which could change the calculus. Don't know yet. And what is Level 1? I'm signing out. Find me in the Level 1 forums. <laughs>